Hello, thanks for joining me today. Today we're going to be discussing constipation. So what is constipation? Let's start with the definition. So constipation can be one of three things. Um, one thing that it can be is it can just be infrequent bowel movements. Um, so now what is infrequent? Um, depending on the person, uh, it can vary. Um, however, they say on average, a person, su person should be um, having about three bowel movements a week. So three times per week. So anyone less than that generally considered constipation, but again, this can actually be normal as well, depending on vari the normal variation from one person to another. Um, not only can it be infrequent bowel movements, but someone could be having frequent bowel movements. However, they have difficulty with bowel movements. So they notice that they have to strain really hard. Uh, they're on the toilet for a very long time. And so it can be uh, a big problem there. So just infrequency is not the only definition, difficulty as well. And finally, someone could you know, be going frequently, having no difficulty, but they have what's called incomplete defecation. So they go ahead, they use a the bathroom normally, they use it fine. However, they feel like they need to go back or they haven't finished uh, completely evacuating. So these are generally your three um, overarching definitions for constipation. So let's talk about uh, some of the causes of that. So let's get straight into the etiology. So the number one factor is going to be lifestyle factors. Um, in particular, these are going to be patients who are having um, incorrect diets. And so this is going to be a diet that's low in fiber and a diet low in fluid. Also, they could be having, they could be eating certain things which are causing constipation, such as they could be having a lot of milk, coffee, tea, and alcohol. And um, also, they could be, they're having decreased exercise. And this is usually, or they might not, it might not necessarily be due to laziness or poor lifestyle choices. It might just be they're immobile for whatever reason. Uh, overall, um, diet and exercise is the most common cause of constipation. So these are the first things that you want to ask about and think of. Uh, next, we'll talk about primary um, constipation. This primary constipation is defined when there is no underlying cause and there is no pain. Um, these two would be um, primary. Now, if there is pain, so why is no pain important? Because if there's pain, then that's going to be irritable bowel syndrome and constipation predominant. So um, in order to be called primary, there has to be no finding underlying cause and no pain. Um, there are, this is broken down into three different types. Um, the first type is called the normal transit constipation. So in normal transit constipation, uh, the actual movement of feces through the colon is normal. And so this means they're going to have normal bowel frequency. So where's the trouble? Well, the trouble is going to be they're going to have difficult evacuation. So um, there will be uh, the frequency. So if we go over here, it's not that it's going to be infrequent. It's going to be that um, they will be having difficulties with the bowel movement. So normal transient constipation is going to be difficulty with bowel movement. So that's the first one. Uh, the second type of primary is going to be called slow transient constipation. So what does this mean? This means that um, just normally the stool is moving slowly throughout the colon. So what that means is going to be a decreased frequency. And so overall, they're going to have a decreased urgency to use the bathroom because it takes time for them to actually get the feces, fecal matter into the rectum. And so then there's going to be a lot of straining. So with, um, with slow transit, your problem is going to be with infrequent bowel movements um, rather than the other two. So that's a slow transit. And finally, um, we're going to have pelvic floor dysfunction. Now, the pelvic floor is important uh, for normal uh, defecation. And so um, people with this problem will have incomplete evacuation. And what they'll need to do is in order to evacuate completely, they need to do what's called a digital evacuation, where they use their finger to push up on either the perineal area or the vaginal area, depending on the gender there. So um, th these are going to be your primary causes. Again, these are causes that don't have any underlying features. So now we're going to talk about primarily the secondary causes. Uh, so the next most common here is going to be related to medications. So certain medications are known for causing constipation. The one of the best known is opioids. So opioids does have um, constipation. We have diuretics as well because that decreases the fluid. Um, antidepressants have been known. Um, Antispasmodics, uh, uh, they tend to decrease the contraction of the gut. Um, Anticonvulsants, uh, such as phenytoin, uh, carbamazepine, um, they all are associated with um, constipation. Uh, antacid, the uh, aluminum hydroxide, uh, that is associated with constipation. 
whereas magnesium hydroxide is associated with diarrhea. So that's an important thing to remember. And finally, uh, calcium channel blockers uh, tend to weaken the gut muscle, and so then that can lead to constipation. So those are your medications. Now let's talk about some metabolic derangements. Uh, patients with high calcium, um, uh, you know, hyperglycemia as part of diabetes mellitus, uh, cystic fibrosis patients, and celiac patients all can get constipation, as well as people with hypothyroidism. So people with low thyroxine are also associated with constipation. So those are just some uh, metabolic or endocrine disorder that you want to think of. Um, muscular causes. So of course we know in order to defecate and um, move, move um, fecal matter throughout the colon, you, it needs muscle. So muscular problems, uh, primarily you're going to be looking at muscular dystrophy. Um, so that's what we, so that's going to be kind of a congenital thing there. Um, neurological problems, so not only do you need muscular, but you also need to you know, have that neurological coordination. Um, this can be associated with patients who have Parkinson's disease. Um, multiple sclerosis is another one. Um, patients suffering from spinal cord injury, and especially pudendal nerve and uh, Hirschsprung disease. So Hirschsprung disease, of course, this would be congenital cause. Um, next is going to be IBS. IBS is also kind of idiopathic. However, the only thing is um, it's a primary cause plus there's pain. And then this generally alternates with uh, diarrhea. So it's an alternate type of condition. So something to keep in mind if you see that they're having both constipation and diarrhea off and on. Uh, finally, obstructive causes. So obstructive causes um, are something that blocks lumen. So this could either be something like colon cancer or volvulus. So and there's other obstructive disease, but we'll just kind of cover these two. And finally, um, psychiatric. Um, these can be, you know, they can have a fear of the pain that's associated with, especially if they have anal fissures, um, you know, a fear of public restrooms, so they, you know, hold it in, or just laziness. Uh, some people, you know, for whatever reason, they don't want to go use the bathroom at certain moments, so they always kind of hold back until the end, you know, maybe watching a video, uh, maybe, maybe watching a football game or, you know, doing something they don't want to get up from. So um, that's going to be your etiology. So now let's talk about, um, you know, how you diagnose these patients or you get, I guess I'd say more like work up these patients. First thing you start with, with history because you want to make sure that you, they do have constipation. So you talk about, you know, the frequency of the uh, uh, stools, um, how hard it is, uh, how difficult it is. Uh, in, in you know defecating, um, they might have associated symptoms of bloating, uh, distension. They may have abdominal pain, which is important, and they may even get a headache. And oftentimes, people with constipation also have fatigue. Um, and so, also with the stool, you want to ask any maneuvers they do. Uh, you know, the digital uh, evacuation uh, is very important to discuss. Um, on top of that, you do want to make sure you discuss the uh, type of diet they have. Uh, making sure they're having a lot of fluids and fibers, that's important, and the exercise schedule. So again, these are the most common causes, so you definitely want to discuss that. On physical examination, um, you can palpate the abdomen, and uh, if you're good enough or if, if it's severe enough, you can't actually feel lumps. Um, next, um, you can do a rectal exam, um, and when you're doing a rectal exam, the first thing you want to do is you want to look around the anus, and you're looking for any fissures, um, hemorrhoids, and fistulas. And remember, these are actually complications of constipation as well, so they kind of work both ways. Um, then you want to um, digitally palpate you know, and check the sphincter tone. And when you check the sphincter tone, you want to see if there's any feces in the rectum. Um, and that can lead to, uh, and you can see if it's fecal impaction going on. So that's very, very important. Um, there are some alarm symptoms that I did forget to uh, mention. Uh, if patients have weight loss, bleeding, or anemia, um, then you must rule out cancer. Uh, colon cancer and especially if they're elderly then that's the one of the first things you want to do and so then which study would you want to do um, investigation would you want to do um, well one that you can do is uh, going to be the x-ray uh, x-ray can show um, the actual feces here so um, right here you can see you know you have uh, kind of feces right there and uh, feces kind of stuck right there and generally what you'll notice is you can see that it's going to be uh, like opaque white with gas around it. And so you can actually see that. So you have kind of this white matter here and then the gas. So this is the stool and this is kind of the gas uh, that's trapped, trapped around it. So that's uh, what you're looking for on x-ray. Now, however, if you do, if you are considering um, colon cancer, um, so that's one, two, um, you want to do a colonoscopy. So 
colonoscopy um, is generally done if you're suspecting colon cancer, um, otherwise not routinely done. Um, and so basically what would make you suspect colon cancer, any of these three symptoms, you definitely want to go ahead and do that right away. Um, you can also do a barium enema, um, and so barium enema allows you to see the uh, colon as well. However, colonoscopy is better primarily because with a colonoscopy you can get a biopsy, or with an enema you can't, so that uh, tends to be more important. Uh, transit tests, um, these are tests that kind of show if, if the stool is moving slowly through the colon or not, and how fast it's moving through. Um, there's two different types of tests. You can either use a radio opaque marker, or you can do what's called a radio scintigraphy, but uh, I mean, these would be kind of for specialized uh, gastroenterologists. I don't think uh, it's done too often. Um, you can also do a, a balloon expulsion test where you put in a balloon into the rectum, you put in about 50 milliliters of water, and you see uh, how patent the anus is. Um, you can also do anal manometry where you, uh, you're looking for the sphincter tone again. If, it's, if the sphincter tone is really high, that could be a cause of constipation. And you want to do neurological testing. Uh, especially if there's fecal incontinence where they're you know just evacuating on their own and this could be electromyography which is looking at the muscles um, but and who would you want to do this you want to do this with people with spinal injury such as spinal cord injury and other types of uh, neurological deficits so that's uh, the neurological test you can do some lab work um, you definitely want to do cbc and if they do end up having anemia then you need to do a fecal occult blood test uh, to see how much you know to make sure the blood actually going in through the uh, into colon there. Uh, leukocytes you want to check for, especially if there's uh, fever and post-op ileus, uh, you want to check the leukocytes. Um, a thyroid, because low thyroid can cause constipation, so you want to check that. And finally, electrolytes. Like we mentioned earlier, um, when the electrolytes are off, especially calcium, uh, you can get constipation. So uh, those are your kind of investigations that you want to do. Finally, let's get to treatment here. First line of treatment, as always, in these type of conditions, diet and exercise so you want to make sure that they're um, having good diet and exercise uh, this means avoiding you know food that gives them constipation but more likely it just means you make sure they have a high fiber diet high fluid remember eight glasses a day of water is what's recommended so then you should be having that and of course they want to avoid medications and foods that are constipating uh, so keep that in mind um, after that, if that doesn't work, you can move on to pharmacological management. Um, there are many different drugs, I'll just kind of mention briefly here, I'm not going to go into too much detail. But you have the bulk forming you know, drugs which are kind of like fibers, uh, stool softeners such as emollients, uh, prokinetic agents, um, you know, causing the stool to move faster, um, osmotic uh, laxatives and even uh, prosecutory laxatives. So that's your pharmacological treatment. If um, there are some surgical treatments, this will be necessary if there is obstruction um, or volvulus. And, you know, obviously, if you have ischemia, you definitely want to go into surgery and uh, try to take out the bile or try to restore the blood flow. So hope that was good for you guys. Um, see you guys in a future video. Thank you very much.